family. And there are many of you in our audience this morning, including my special friend Leon this morning, that could speak into the roles and the call of what it looks like to be an elder, the qualities, the characteristics, all of those sorts of things. So this morning we're going to just grab a hold of a snapshot that Paul gives us in his letter to Timothy. There are many that we could unravel this morning. But the point is, in, in giving this little uh, intro to that, is, is that this whole thing of leadership, we don't want to just come this morning and spill out four little points about it and then go off on our merry way and pray over Dwayne and Matt and, and just commission them to this role and then off we go on our daily business. But I think as we open up our Bibles and we truly come to it with a surrender and an openness for God's Spirit to show us something from His inspired Word that you'll find that each and every one of you, while maybe not to the role of an elder this morning, but each and every one of you is a leader. You've been called to lead. You've been called, first off, to lead you. Now, we pray that we will be guiding and directing you towards the ultimate leader, Christ Jesus, and choosing him to be Lord of your life, following the example and the testimony that he left. But ultimately, our creator designed us and made us with the opportunity to choose, with a free will inside of us that we can choose for ourselves. Now, we'll unpack in a moment here that once we choose, once we make that choice, once we lead ourselves to that point of choosing, of decision, then the boundaries and so forth that come forth from that decision, we're no longer able to decide. Remember, we've discussed in our past here in our discussion on what it takes to travel that everlasting way, replacing the lies with the truth, redeeming our minds, renewing our minds to what God's Word shows us, and now most recently in reframing our focus onto Him, that as we set our gaze on that everlasting way, traveling on it here on earth, we find Along that way, that the mind of the flesh, remember, leads to death. The mind of the spirit leads to life. So leading your place, leading yourself along those lines of choosing those fleshly things, you're no longer able to decide the outcome of that. It leads to death. You can't steer the ship in a different direction. If you continue to lead yourself down that path of fleshly desire and passion, it will lead to death. Vice versa, and much more glorious, is when we surrender ourselves to the leadership of Christ Jesus and his spirit within us. It leads to everlasting life. Only Christ himself has paid in full the ultimate price, the ultimate redemption for that to be possible. So today, you're all leaders, and our hope is, as I mentioned, that indeed you will surrender that leadership to Jesus Christ. You know, we can't lead ourselves, excuse me, you can't lead others, let's start over, you can't lead others to places that you yourself aren't willing to go. So if we're wanting to be a light, a witness, a testimony to the world that we go and visit out there as we walk outside these doors, then just as Lori reminded us in her testimony, we have to have an interconnection ourselves with the Savior, an encounter with His Spirit, living, abiding, staying in tune and fresh with His Word that He has given to us. That is the only way that we can lead others to those streams of living water. In the material world, if you promise things and commit things to others that you don't have, you will find yourself quickly walking along the paths of bankrupt, bankruptcy and losing everything, or you'll have a lot of dangerous objects and things pointed at you. Spiritually, then, the same is true that if I promise or if I commit things to people that I myself don't have, then I leave them feeling empty, lonely, dissatisfied and lost, oftentimes earning myself the label of hypocrite or fake, all of which we don't ultimately want. That's not who we want to be known as. So let's look together at 2 Timothy chapter 2 to get a picture of who we as Christians are called to be as leaders and with the direction of his word kind of begin sorting that out, teaching of his spirit, sort that out, how that looks to be a leader for me first and then for others around me in this kingdom work. You'll find in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we don't have time for all of them today. They're actually, you could probably dig out while they're not named specifically, you can dig out seven different pictures, seven different examples from Paul's writing to, to Timothy of what a leader should look like. First we find that of a steward, a soldier, a farmer. 
a servant, uh, a workman, a vessel, an athlete. The first four are the ones that we'll zero in on today, but truly you could find all of them there. Let's read together 2 Timothy chapter 2, the first eight verses. Here's what it says. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Christ Jesus. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Let's stop there and pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of life that you have blessed us with, physically, air to breathe, the capacities within these shells, these bodies, to sustain life so far today. And Heavenly Father, I pray that indeed we would find, as we leave here today, by the time we depart from this place, a new awakening spiritually as well, a new awareness and appreciation for the spiritual life, the life of our souls, the life, the transformation power that you offer to our hearts to also usher into our lives. I thank you for each person who is here this morning. And Heavenly Father, I pray that even through the songs that we were reminded of, through the words of the songs, I pray that we would be reminded of the fact this morning that Your word says in Philippians chapter 2 that it is your work within us, (laughs) that good pleasure of work within us, both to do and to will (laughs) those things that you have called us to. So Heavenly Father, I pray that while not all of us are called to be, to fill the role, that leader role in the position of an elder on a leadership team of a congregation, but you have all called us to lead, to lead us, to lead us And guide us by the power of your spirit within us. But then we're also able to lead others, our family, our children, our co-workers to the saving knowledge of you. To that further, deeper walk of relationship with you. So be near us, Lord Jesus, I pray. Join with us now as we begin to break apart the words that we just read. May it speak life and truth within us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first picture that we find of a leader is found in those first two verses. It's that of a steward. And different than those other first three that are listed there, we don't have it by name. It doesn't come out and say steward. I think as you break those words apart in the description that's given there, that indeed you will find that stewardship is part of leadership. You'll find in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes about the stewardship, that good order that has been given to Timothy. So he's talking about a deposit, that's something that's been entrusted to you. Oftentimes, as, a, as you think of a steward, you'll think of a manager. While you yourself might not be the owner of the goods, you've been called, you've been chosen, you've been asked, you've been commissioned to manage, to steward well Whatever it is that has been offered to you for your, for your management, for your, uh, for your order, for your direction. And all of that comes from an overseer who is, has given you this charge. Now we know, those of us who have grown up in the church, that obviously we're, we're beginning to think along those lines in the spiritual realm where Christ Jesus ultimately is our leader, right? Offering that good deposit of salvation and good works and those types of things into our life. But then we are the good managers, we are the good stewards of that, appointed by Christ Jesus to do those things that he's called and commissioned us to do. You have been appointed a manager. You have been appointed a steward of that thing, (laughs) that good deposit that has been entrusted to your care. Did you know that those of us who are believers, the Bible says that we're not our own. You were bought with a price. The blood of Jesus paid in full. And he has commissioned you to carry that free and perfect gift of his grace into the world that you meet and greet. So how well have you been managing? How well have you been stewarding? All of you have been called to carry that out, perhaps not in the role of an elder in a church leadership team, but all of you have been called to do that. How well have we been doing that? 
The Bible says this, unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain who build it, right? So the, the, the gifting, <laughs> the call, the commission comes not from ourselves. While we commit this good work to the Lord Jesus Christ, he must remain our ultimate overseer. He must remain the Lord of our lives in order for us to manage and to steward this thing that he is wanting to do among us. For when we take those plans and those thoughts and those ways in, of our, in and of ourselves, the Bible says we labor in vain. That's also a mismanagement of that commitment, of that entrustment that has been offered to us. That gift of divine grace and power, delivered from God on high, is a deposit of great treasure, not for us to keep of ourselves, but for us to share. That interest and value that occurs, incurs or occurs, what's the right uh, accounting term? I didn't jot that down. Builds up. You know what I'm trying to say. Del, you should be up here. That builds up, that interest of God's good deposit that builds up within us, that's not for us to hoard and to keep for ourselves. The giftings of us as a body, of you as an individual, those are to use for God's glory and honor, for his kingdom building purposes, not for you to gain any glory or stature of your own, but for you to share with the world around you, and particularly in relation to us as a congregation here today, Matt and Dwayne. It's for you to offer to the good and the well-being and the health of this congregation. The word entrust there in the, in the second verse. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust, some of your translations may say committed or commit, right? So that word actually means, depending on your translation of if it says committed or entrust, and it breaks down into the same word, here's what it means. To place by the side of or near or set before. <laughs> Does that remind you anything? That example that Christ Jesus has set before you, he who endured the cross, despising its shame, now reigns at the Father's right hand. That example that has been set before you, that has been set near you, that has been entrusted to you, go and do likewise. How well have you been stewarding that? One of the greatest examples, I think, in God's word of that whole sharing aspect of that good treasure within is this found in 2 Corinthians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. So there it is. He's, he's the one who this comes from, this comfort that we're about to receive. It comes from him. He is the ultimate overseer, so to speak. He comforts us in all, no clauses there, no loopholes, no open ends, all of our affliction, so that, so that Jason can hoard it, so that I can keep it all to myself? No. What does it say? So that we may be, able to com may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Like it or not, all of us are building a legacy. Some type of impression that will be left of us when our time on earth is over. Everyone has one. Everyone is leaving one behind. Some of you, you're stewarding and managing well that opportunity for you to build a legacy. You're doing it in a healthy way that's honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. And that legacy will speak on, hopefully for generations, as long as the Lord allows life to tarry here on this earth. Vice versa, or the contrary is also true, that some of you, some of us, are leaving legacies that have been hijacked. Hijacked by the lies of the enemy. Hijacked by the deception of the evil one. And now you are negative, negatively impacting those around you, leaving a negative, a legacy that speaks forth things that are not, they're contrary to the things of the Spirit. So those lies, those addictions, those destructive, destructive behaviors, those thought processes that are not of the Lord, they, you all, all of us, those, all of those things only have the amount of control that we release to them. So this morning, I'm wondering, I wanted to ask us, how well am I stewarding, how well am I managing even those dark, stormy trails that I've encountered? How well am I managing, if you've been here for the recent past, how well am I stewarding, managing, directing those back into the obedience of Jesus Christ, taking them captive, laying them at his feet, or mismanaging them and on my own strength and power trying to deal with them, quickly finding that my well of willpower doesn't run very deep.
Building a leader doesn't happen in a day. Rather, it's a daily journey. It's not a sprint. It's often a marathon. We don't rise up and just become one. It's a daily journey of God's sanctifying power and strength and grace within us, refining us, fine-tuning us to the call that he has before us. In order to lead well, then a good steward must be a diligent student of God. That's what that word at the end of uh, those words at the end of verse two mean when it says "able to teach." I can only be a teacher if I'm also a learner, right? Once you're done learning, you're also done growing. I once heard a person say, "We must be constant learners, constant students of God's word if we're going to be able to lead the world well." John Wooden, the famous successful basketball coach, one of the greatest of all time, says this, what a leader learns after you've learned it all counts most of all. What a leader learns after you've learned it all counts most of all. He said you should always call yourself a teacher and be constantly aware and observing. Always seek to improve yourself and the team. A healthy, godly legacy that we as believers that we as believers desire to leave behind is only fully preserved and passed on to future generations when we lead ourselves into becoming good students of God's word, willing to share what we've learned with others. In the Old Testament, we read of those instructions to talk about those things, write about those things, think about those things. When you sit down, when you lie down, when you get up, when you walk, when you run, it sh- those thoughts should always be on your mind. Going the wrong way here. Those thoughts should always be on your mind. And some of you may be saying, oh, come on, preacher man. How is that possible? I've, I've got work things to process in my mind. I've got responsibilities to contemplate in my mind. You're right. You're true. But let us ask ourselves a very sobering question. I wonder... My guess is, based off of prior experience in my own life, that there are many in our audience here this morning that you wouldn't have to go too far back into your thoughts inventory, into the inventory of your thoughts, to find that last lustful, prideful, selfish thought that you spent a whole lot of time pondering, playing out in your mind. And whether you were at work, whether you were with your family, That was spinning in your brain, on and on it went, and you allowed it way too much time and momentum in that. Guys, we have to be good stewards, we have to be leaders in the pursuit of Christ Jesus, and allowing his word, his spirit, to be constant residences, resident, take constant residence in our hearts and in our minds. I understand that we have work obligations, that we have family choices to make. But at the root, at the heart of the foundation of who we are, it should be a constant thought process of ways that I can become more like Jesus or serve as an example of him. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them. How can I teach them if I don't have them? Be a leader. Go find them. To your children, you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. The point is, I can't do things these verses suggest and I, unless I am leading me <laughs> to that constant pursuit of him. You're a leader, and you're a good leader if you're a good steward of that good deposit within you. Number two, we find if you want to be a good leader, then you also need to be a good soldier. We find that description in verses three and four, and if we would have kept reading, we'd find it in verses eight through 13. Remember that word in trust back in the second verse, that thing that has been offered to you, committed to you, set near you, set before you, kind of as to be your leader, to be your guide? If we jump back one chapter to chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, we'll find the same word, commit or entrust, playing out in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 14 and 16, only this time it takes a deeper emphasis. It takes a deeper meaning. <laughs> it's, in other words, it's, it's carrying the meaning of, I am being committed, I am being offered, I am being, it's being set before you, but it's also being deposited within you. 
And this is something that we can't find of ourselves. It's a gift that comes in. That's the thought process of the word. I didn't take the time to break it down because of the sake of time. But there's only three times that that word is used. This word commit or entrust in this framework is used. It's in these two verses and then also in First Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, where it gives that power of mission, that commission on, on Timothy's life. Verse 4 is sometimes misinterpreted as a call is as simply a means to stay away from all those secular pursuits. And in our humanness, perhaps we've joined up and we've formulated some rules or some guidelines on what we think the abstinence of those secular worldly pursuits should look like. Perhaps we weren't allowed to play in a church league softball or, or maybe it's this or maybe it's that. We begin to put these boundaries and formations around it. And I think deeper yet into what Paul's saying here is that it's not that we have to abstain all the way from every single thing, right? So I can spend countless hours, days, weeks, and perhaps even years trying to find dirt on Target, on Walmart, or on this, or on that, on reasons why I should not buy goods from them because of their participation in the things of the world. So we'll go, we'll drive ourselves crazy. We really will if that's our constant pursuit. But at the heart of it, Jesus, what Jesus is saying through Paul to Timothy is as a good soldier, as a good soldier, those things should not cause us to swerve away from our ultimate pursuit of pleasing and honoring Christ Jesus. And with that, then we find that there are three specific analogies that begin to, to flesh out in this passage. The first off is like a soldier, if you want to be a good leader, a leader of you, then you must have a single-minded focus. Specifically, most pointedly, namely, Jesus. He must be your single focus in your life to proclaim the name of Jesus in and through you. We are always finding loopholes, caveats to those things of the world that we should abstain from or, oh yeah, I'm doing that. They're a, they're a Christian-based organization or they're a faith-based business. Like we'll pour into them. Listen guys, they're human, right? So we're going to find a loophole sometime. So Jesus isn't saying, he's saying, like, you're going to be in the world, right? Remember the prayer that he offered for his disciples and ultimately for us before he went to the cross? He's saying, Father, I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world. <laughs> Remember, he's commissioned them to be disciples, to go into all the world and to proclaim who he is. But he says to protect them from the evil one. I pray that you wouldn't take them out of the world, but you would protect them from the evil one. How am I going to hold up my shield of faith unless my focus isn't on my commander? my commanding officer, Christ Jesus. If you want to lead well, you have to have a single-minded focus on Christ Jesus. Funny story, I shouldn't say it, but some of you I said the other night, maybe just as an example to get us to understand what this means. So we have a little dog named Zeke, right? Right now we're babysitting uh, John and Carleen and Ty and Lexi's uh, dog, Livy. All right, so when Livy comes to play at our house, Zeke loses his mind. He forgets all of his rules that we've trained him to do, he completely loses his mind. He has one single focus, Livy. He will do things that he never has done before. He'll do things in the garage that he has never done before because Livy's there. He has a single-minded focus to chase and to please Livy and to be near Livy all of his live-long days, and he will do everything he can to make that happen. I'm wondering, goofy analogy, goofy example, I'm sorry for that. It's the best I could come up with this past week. I'm wondering how many of us have a single-minded focus that we would be willing to give up, as Paul instructs Timothy, all of our human pursuits in order that we could please, honor, and glorify the Lord of our lives, the founder, the perfecter, the author of our faith, Christ Jesus. When was the last time that we could honestly evaluate our lives, the thought processes of my mind, and say, that was there. I didn't do it perfectly, but ultimately that was my, the trajectory of my path. Single-minded focus. Jesus said to Martha, remember when he went and visited Mary and Martha in that village? Martha comes to him and he's like, oh, come on. I need, I'm doing all the work here. Martha, Martha, Martha. You're distracted about many things right now. Mary has a single-minded focus. Mary's thoughts are on the good treasure that's before her. When was the last time? When was the last time? Number two, the second analogy that we gather is out of verse five, and it's that of an, uh, of an athlete. A couple years ago, um, 
I've seen some of Dwayne and Lori's uh, offspring, kiddos there, but we participated in the turkey stampede. It wasn't this past year, Reuben and Carmen, but it was a couple years before that. I was running with my nephew. We signed up for the 10K. He was a senior in high school on the cross country and track team at the time, so pretty decent runner. Some of his, uh, some of his teammates were also there that morning. They had all signed up for the 10K. Uh, so when you sign up for, the, for this particular race, you have a little bib with a number on it that you pin to your shirt. On the bib, there's a little time uh, chip in it that when you cross the finish line, it begins your time when you cross... Yeah, what I say? When you begin the race and you start, you go across the beginning line, it starts your time. When you end the race and you cross back over the finish line, obviously it records more of an official type of thing. Anyhow, so these guys are cross-country runners, right? So they've practiced like timing of their run, the, the pace, the orientation to geography. Like they're in on it. They, they know what's going on. It's not just like a, a race they wake up and run then one day. The point with all of that is that as, as we were getting ready to take off, right? So they take off and they both, they all said together before the race began, they're going to try something different. They're going to really get a good burst out of, out of the gate, really get it going. And then maybe they'll plateau a little deeper in. And then it, like mile five and six, they're going to really turn on the gas again and see if they can get a good time. Long story short, we finished the race. These guys, like, I don't even know where they went when we first took off. I'm back gasping for air yet. When we finished the race, we all get to gather up together, and they have this big uh, jumbotron thing that starts displaying the scores, the time of all these people. And these, there's three guys, three guys from the team that are like, the, their scores are the top. And it's, it's unheard of. Like, it's almost world record time for a 10K race. And they're, they're actually unbelieving of it. They're like, well, yeah, I mean, it felt good. Well, yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, wow. And we're like, there's no way. And John, my nephew that was running with them, um, he's like, that, there is, that's impossible. Like, I run with you guys in races. You've never been able to do that or even get close. What ended up happening was, is they missed some of the markers on the trail. So we have green, yellow, and red markers to mark the different course. Somewhere along the way, they had got off course and jumped on to the 5K, <laughs> which is half the distance of a 10K, by the way. They blew the 10K time out of the water. Well, with a little investigation, we discovered and the officials of the race discovered, oh yeah, they followed the green arrows. You were actually supposed to follow the yellow arrows. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, so anyhow, they, they completely stirred off course. What's happening here, what Jesus is saying is if you want to be a good leader, follow the example of an athlete. You all remember names if you've been in the world at any amount of time. You remember names like, I'm not to throw them under the bus, but names like Lance Armstrong. Barry Bonds, um, let me jot down a few others, Reggie Bush, the 96 University of Connecticut men's basketball team, all champions that had their trophies stripped away, had, their, had that championship title taken away from them for a season. Now, Reggie Bush, his, his has got reinstated to him. He lost the Heisman Trophy. But all were because... They didn't play by the rules. They went outside of the boundaries. What Paul is saying here is if you want to be a good leader, you have to have single-minded focus to Jesus, your commanding officer, and obedience to the boundaries and the guidelines of the race that he has set before you. No one here, we can't establish our own finish line and just start going any which way, right? Uh, I remember going down to Kokomo. We, so our GPS and our vehicle was like way old and we were not paying for the update on it, right? And we were going down to see Landon one time at the hospital in Indy and all of a sudden it just showed us driving in this field, right? It's because the GPS hadn't coordinated, hadn't been updated to the new 31 bypass. And so we were out in the middle of this field and it kept saying, destination unknown, it's not able to find your location. That's kind of how it looks for some of us in our lives, right? Like we want to get there, but we're operating on our own boundaries, on our own rules. We're running our own race and we're all over the place. Do you know God has given us an orderly description of beauty for us to use in our lives? Single-minded focus, obedience to his word, running as an athlete, the chart, chart marched out, chart drawn out for you. He says this in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. 
2 Timothy chapter 3. Don't let those corruptions around you, just like what happened to Moses when, the, when those guys tried to oppose you, when the false teachers, when all those voices come speaking to you, those men who oppose the truth, men corrupted, corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. Why were they disqualified? Because they'd formulated their own truth. They were running by their own boundaries, by their own rules, instead of by this. Paul says that'll earn you disqualification real quick. Be careful who you're obeying. Number three, we find in verse six, and perhaps it's the most difficult to see, and the one uh, for those of us who are a little cautious about being legalistic, the one that we fight against and push against the most. If you're wanting to lead well, you have to be willing to work hard, to work well. (laughs) Hard work, it's hard work. Being a disciple of Christ Jesus is hard work. It takes hard work. Being energized, by the hope of the promise of Christ Jesus, though, is what, remember from a few weeks ago, hope is what gives us that fuel. We have a promise that will not disappoint, Romans 5.5. 5. He's deposited something in the hearts of us as believers to guarantee that, his spirit, the love of his spirit within us. That promise won't fail. That promise, he won't be, fa- he will be, excuse me, he will be faithful to carry that out. Hope is our fuel for the journey, friends. But we must be willing to do our part to walk alongside that journey that he has mapped out for us. Willing to endure the hard work that it takes for some of those uphill climbs. Willing to put in the hard work that it takes to scale some of those hurdles. Single-minded focus on Jesus and obedience to his proclamation of victory is how we do that and chart that and stay that course. He uses the example of a farmer, a hard-working farmer, he says. Remember, A farmer, he can't control the rain, he can't control the sun, he can't control the hail, the tornado, the drought, or the flood, none of which he can control. But it doesn't keep him from the hard work that it takes to till the soil, to prep the soil, to plant the seed, and to nurture the seed until God gives the life. I wonder, when was the last time you could honestly say that yes, I have been leading me well. I have been a soldier, an athlete, a farmer, a steward, with single-minded focus, with the obedience to his word, willing to put in the hard work to make it happen. Enter by the narrow way, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are are few. For those of us who are sp- feels like we've been spinning our wheels, like we have been putting in the hard work, we have been trying, I would like to ask you do, to do as the Apostle Paul tells us in verse 7. Welcome in to the room, Christ and His Spirit. Welcome into the room, the Spirit of the living God and the proclamation of His Word into your life. Think about it. When was the last time you sincerely asked Jesus to help you in your journey? We have a lot of availability to strum up ways to instill new plots and plans to generate more willpower, more oomph, whatever you want to call it. (laughs) Those tanks, as I mentioned at the outset, will all run dry. But the Spirit of the living God, even when, if you would continue on in that chapter 2, even when we are faithless, He is faithful. His Word says that it will not return void. And if these promises that He offers to us today or for you and for me and for all of us in this room, then his word will hold true and he will carry that out. If God is for us, Jesus says, or excuse me, Paul says to Timothy, remember Jesus. So in other words, this is your proof. This is your validation that this will happen in your life. Just as he does in Romans. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up also, how will he not also give you all things for you to walk this path of righteousness? Manage it as a faithful, wise steward with undivided attention. Guard and protect it as a strong soldier, as a committed and devoted athlete. Honor and cherish it with your life, persevering through each and every circumstance with the efforts of a hardworking farmer. You are a leader, Timothy. Paul wants Timothy to remember, and I say that to you. You are a leader. I am a leader. Maybe not leading as in the role of an elder like Matt and Dwayne will soon be commissioned to do. But you have been called and commissioned 
to lead with a single-minded focus on Jesus, with an obedience to him and his word, and a willingness to put in the hard work to get there. To each of every one of us here today, let's leave with this charge that Paul left with Timothy later in this very same chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. That's a charge, not just for Dwayne and Matt, but for all of us here today that have been entrusted with that good deposit of our Heavenly Father from above. That same famous John Wooden said that there is no one thing, there's no easy way to success and beauty. It comes through hard work and dedication. Today, we're going to pray over, (laughs) dedicate to the Lord, Dwayne and Matt, to the service of his kingdom, serving in the role and the capacity of an elder here on this leadership team. But before we do that, and as we pray, just for a dedication for us all, I want us to be mindful of that good word that Paul had set forth for Timothy. Am I willing, am I seeking, am I pursuing those things that we unpack today in my life? My rationalizing and reasoning away, reasoning away the call that he's placed on all of our lives. We've been talking a lot about changing our thoughts and changing our lives. Those things that have taken control over us, they have perhaps become oppressive. They have perhaps become manipulating. They have perhaps become a dictator in your life. But today, through the redeeming work of Christ Jesus, you and his spirit, through the guidance of his word, can begin taking leadership of your life today. We would love to be able to walk with you in that and walk alongside you in that through whatever capacity that may look like. But today, just leave that as a challenge. Could you honestly say that, yeah, while my life isn't perfect, my life is a life of progress as a leader, and I am always surrendered to the, and open to what God has for me, But I can honestly say this verse is where I'm at. This verse is what I'm pursuing. Or have we missed the mark somewhere along the way, running by a different set of boundaries, rules, and guidelines with a single focus on me, myself, and I versus on Jesus? We're going to pray, and as we pray, I invite Dwayne and Lori and Matt and Elaine to just come forward and to stand on here. And Dwayne and, excuse me, (laughs) Del and Geneva and Lana and Sophie and my wife, you can join with us. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning as we conclude our time of examination of your word, we just pray, Lord God Almighty, that you would sense, receive the surrender of our own wills and the invitation for your spirit to come and move among us and in us in such a way, Lord Jesus, that we would understand the call to leadership that you have actually called all of us to in some regards, in some capacities, of who we are created in you, Christ Jesus. And God, I pray that today we wouldn't take that call and that, that thing, that, the, that good work that you've entrusted to us, Lord Jesus, that we wouldn't take that and use for any promotion or praise of our own, but God, that we would steward it in such a way that would return all glory, honor, and praise back to you. God, I pray for the one who is here this morning who perhaps find themselves, finds themselves not even understanding what Paul's call to Timothy was all about and the way to make that application true for their own life. God, I pray that you would just speak to their hearts. And Heavenly Father, I pray that no one here in this audience would receive verse 7 and 8 of our text today as some simple little cliche that we pat somebody on the back with and then we send off on our way. But God, I pray that today through a heart that is surrendered to you, devoted to have you move and work and speak into our lives that as we think about these things, as we think about these things, meditate, commit to you, God, that we would receive just the guidance and the direction, the instruction, the admonition of your Spirit's work within us, ultimately bringing to life this inspired word that you have given to us. So may this day be a special day of continued worship as we leave this place. Lead and guide us now.
in this next time of worship as we dedicate Matt and Dwayne to the role of elder here on our leadership team at Living Hope. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As these fine folks join me up front here this morning, one thing that, um, yeah, we just want everyone to be mindful of is that just as we received and talked about with this morning with taking in the new members, that this is the Lord's work. This is the Lord's business. This is the Lord's deal. And as we begin to flesh out through those examples that we covered this morning, I pray that we as a team can begin and continue to and be unified.